Welcome to Objection in the Forum. We've got a great episode today. Got the guys from Investors Title here from Raleigh. Welcome. Thank you, Justin. Can you guys introduce yourself to the audience and kind of talk a little bit about, about what you do and what your role is at Investors? Okay, yeah. Uh, my name is Ryan Wainio. Uh, I'm a title attorney is what I refer to myself as with an Investors Title. I'm also a Senior Vice President of North Carolina Underwriting Operations. Uh, I spend most of my days in the office dealing with uh, messy titles, meaning people are trying to buy and sell homes or refinance mortgages and uh, somebody's done a, a title search on the property and found a problem that we need to deal with. So uh, not the most exciting thing at cocktail parties, but hopefully it will be a great topic. For no, it's, it, it, it can be. Uh. <laughs> yeah. And I'm Gates Granger and I'm actually in the Charlotte office mm -hmm. and I have a similar role, but on the commercial side. So I'm working on commercial deals in North Carolina, but frankly across the Southeast and even across the country. Again, looking at those title issues, trying to coordinate the title search, look at the issues, try to figure out how we might be able to solve something if there's maybe a little issue you know, back in the past. Well, welcome to Wellington, guys. And so the reason why I was asking kind of what it is you do, what I'm familiar with with title insurance a lot of times is something issue comes up, you don't know what to do, you call the, the title company. Is that kind of what you guys do in the residential and commercial realms? Like if an attorney has done a title search and something doesn't make sense, they, they go to you guys and you kind of walk them through the options? Exactly. All day, every day. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we, we try to find the most efficient way to move the transaction forward. So, so what kind of volume are you looking at from, from calls you're getting a, a, a day right now? Uh, it's probably, depending on the day, can be anywhere from, well, we'll, we'll, we'll say calls and emails, right? So, oh, yeah. you know, with, with specific title questions, anywhere from 50 to 80. And are those attorney calls you're getting? Uh, mostly. You know, we have issuing offices around the state as well that are dealing uh, directly with the attorneys. They actually issue the policy, and some of those calls or emails will come from them with questions um, about, the, about the title and how and to deal on, with it. And on the commercial side, we also get them from the clients directly, maybe yeah. the lender directly, trying to figure out what something means, or if there's an issue where we're not going to ever get the exact perfect solution, what might be the second best option to solve that and make everybody comfortable. And that makes sense when you're dealing with kind of more sophisticated parties or people that are used to the process and, mm -hmm. and where they might be more comfortable or know the right questions to ask, um, ask you to. Um, so I guess kind of going back to a bigger picture view, you know, I want to start with what title insurance is, what it can do, what it can't do, you know, why it's, why it's important to everybody. Yes, so title insurance. Uh, you know, most people we find it interesting don't even know that they have it, yep. right? Uh, it's it's a lot different from other types of hazard insurance. It's uh, it, it we like to say it insures the past, not the future. Um, uh, typically, you get a title insurance policy when you purchase a house. Um, it's a lender requirement almost always, but it does not have to be. Uh, issued in conjunction with a mortgage loan. If you're paying cash for your house, you should also be getting title insurance. Uh, it, it basically insures you against financial loss, right? If there's a prior lien or an encumbrance yeah. or something like that on your property that you weren't aware of. And that's what I was gonna, that, what you said about the cash transaction is you should have it anyway. And so that's a question I get uh, fairly frequently is if I'm, if I'm doing a cash transaction and uh, typically we just, we, we, you know, we su suggest that people get title insurance, but a lot of, but every once in a while I'll get some pushback where they'll say, well, why, why am I getting title insurance? You know, if there's some kind of, and I tell them, well, because it's in case there's a mistake or something we missed and like, well, can I just sue you if, if, if that's like, well, that, well, thanks. You know, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's always an option, you know, but it might not be an option four years down the road, you know, with the, with the statute of limitations. So, right. so that, so we see it in two situations. Mm -hmm. One is, um, you may not be around, right? I mean, you, you right. Re hopefully someday you retire, you're going to yeah. make it rich and, you know, you know, be on the beach somewhere. But, or it may not even be, statute of limitations may cause, or it may not be an issue that is malpractice. You're only suable if it's malpractice. But if there's a forgery or something like that back in the chain that could not have been discovered, the policy still covers that or likely covers that. We can't. You know, never know in any given situation where it will be covered, but there's a lot of things, in fact, most of the things that are not negligence on the part of the people doing the search. Yeah, I guess that's right, because I think from the attorneys, that's what, that's what we always think about is, well, this is what will come into effect if I make a mistake, but a lot of times, negligent attorney work results in non-coverage. 
I would imagine, because if you're if you research the wrong property or if you've got a legal description error and it's showing up in both, I imagine that would defeat coverage um, with the underlying policy. Does it protect you in a situation like, let's say an attorney does a title search, there's an error in the legal description, mm -hmm. but there's also an error in the legal description that the that the title insurance policy covered is, is if that I don't know if that makes sense what I'm asking but if like but if there's the title insurance company is issuing its policy based on an errant legal description so I, I actually have an example okay perfect. recently of a client that was looking to buy a piece of property we got their description and their and their title policy it was a description of a different piece of property yep. it was not what they were intending to buy there had been a mistake in the prior transaction. So it turns out we never issued a policy, never had a claim or anything like that. But that other title is going to have a claim, and it's going to be would be very interesting because they probably do own the property that was described. The seller owned it, and it was described, but it was not what was intended to be sold to this particular party. So probably probably going to be able to go back and rectify it. So, but you caught that on the front end before yeah. they closed. That's right. Our search caught that on the front end. Our person went in and looked and said, hey, this legal description is not the same as the address you're giving me. And they noticed it, but the prior title company hadn't. So what are the so, kind of tools you're looking at to make those determinations? Is it, it Do you find is it matching up GIS versus legal descriptions? Or or how, how do you go back about kind of identifying that kind of mistake? So a big piece of it is a survey. Mm -hmm. Right, and and that gets left out of a lot of conversations. Um, is a, a client should be getting a survey when they're purchasing a piece of property, right? Yep. Uh, that'll root out whether there are description problems back in the past, whether there are description problems with adjoining properties. Mm -hmm. right? Well, this is something I want to talk to you guys yeah. about because you know, the, in in a lot of times, you know, the attorneys will have in our engagement letters or acknowledgement forms. You might have some kind of um, cover yourself language saying, you know, we advise you get a survey. But, you know, if you're signing it at the closing table, it's like, well, you know, thanks for that. But, but you know, that, that would have been helpful to know quite some time ago. Um, and, and it, it apparently, you know, it, it won. It's going to help with things like uh, encroachments mm -hmm. and things of that nature, but, you know, or easements and, and um, you know, we want to, it makes it easier to identify things of that nature. But it also can affect your title insurance policy, from what I understand. How, how does the, the process work of, it, of getting your survey insured? So we would, we would need the survey, number one. So if we're going to read it into the policy, mm -hmm. right, uh, it needs to be provided us to us before you close so we can review it and read it in, review, remove the, we have a, the general survey exception in the policy if we don't get provided it. So really, if, if your first contact with the client as the attorney is almost at closing, you know, this is a great thing for there's a realtor out there listening. Uh, that, that, that really early on in the process, you know, the realtor should say to the client, do you want a survey? Is right. there additional expense to, to in, ensure your survey? There's no expense on our end mm -hmm. and the value is incredible. So again, on a commercial transaction that I'm looking at right now, talking about ensuring the past, we, uh, we client got a survey of the property as built, you know, it was a commercial facility and there are two or three signs advertising the business that are located right on the property line, which means in fact the sign hangs over a little bit mm -hmm. outside the property. So we're looking at the past, what when it was built, and saying, hey, we this is not quite all on your property. They now have the opportunity to go to that adjoining landowner and say, hey, this sign that hangs a couple feet over into your sign, nobody cares about it, right? Let's get an easement so that no. so you'll agree that we can have our sign there and not have it removed. Have that problem solved now, not five years from now when yeah. they decide to develop and say they don't want the sign there. We can get them to agree to it now. So what are your what are the remedies of a title insurance policy holder when you know situations like this occur? Like there's you know, I, there's an easement nobody told me about, or it turns out my in my t chain of title there was a forgery or something of that nature. What what is What's going to happen, or what? What? How do you cash in on your policy? So, so there's really two things. You file once you file your claim, uh, it'll be evaluated by the claims department, and they will either a you know, fix your title, for lack of a better term, right? You know, if there's a an old easement that crosses your property, you know, they will negotiate with the adjoining landowner who may have the right to use it to see what it takes to terminate the easement. Sometimes mm -hmm. you know, the payment of money to the adjoining landowner, or you know, they will basically indemnify you for loss. So if your property is worth $100,000 without the easement, but the fact that there's an easement across it now makes it worth 60, 
you know, they could pay you for your loss, right? So make, make you whole, essentially. That's why I'd say, you know, we call it contract of indemnity. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of those situations, I, I've, I've heard them referred to as claim repair, almost. Like where it's a situation where, you know, maybe you can fix it through a legal action mm -hmm. or through a negotiation or, or whatever the case may be. Do you have, is it kind of like a car um, type situation where you have a total loss on a property where it's just like, this is this this property has no more value? Uh, we have had total losses on, mm -hmm. on properties before. Um, it's limited to the amount of the policy, right? So if you buy a house for $100,000, typically you're gonna get a $100,000 policy. And that's your, 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 your all in value on it. Um, so if your total loss is that, we have had that situation, but it's rare. I would say very so, rare. A personal example that also involves the survey. The first house I ever bought had a little alleyway going by it. When, they, when we got it surveyed, the back deck kicked into the alleyway a little bit. Now there was a hedge there, and people who drove in that alleyway were driving just fine around the alley. But theoretically, they could the people that drove in there could have said, "Hey, our car's wider. We need you to move remove your deck." My policy that survey saw at the insurance company said, hey, we're taking exception to this. I had to decide as the buyer, was I willing to live with that? Well, this was an older house. That deck was 20 years old. It was five years from needing to be replaced anyway. Yeah. I was gonna bet, I was willing to bet, hey, nobody's ever gonna make me move it. It's working, this alleyway is working just fine. And if it needs to be repaired, I can redesign this. I decide to purchase the house. Yeah. But if that were the corner of the house, Oh, yeah. in the alleyway you might have said hey I don't want to buy that because without resolving the issue because I want to know it beforehand did you still did anybody cause any problems about the deck or did you end up rebuilding it and moving it back we actually sold the house to a to a friend of mine and we discussed it and it is still the same way it is because that alleyway works just so, fine. so that that brings up an interesting point so you get your survey pre and, and probably one of the reasons maybe for the you know the realtors or or sometimes sellers you know they, they might be apprehensive about when somebody gets a survey because well, what if the, the fence is over a foot or, or you know mm -hmm. something like that why why mess up this transaction over over something like this but it, it can um save you from t trouble down the road how do those situations play out with you know your your deck is an encroachment or your fence is encroaching in somebody's yard or vice versa. I mean, is that is that a, is there a title fix to that where you say, well, we're just gonna ensure you that if this is a problem, we'll pay for moving the fence or what? what is the, what's kind of the remedy you're looking for when you do So, that? I mean, there are different levels, right? So sometimes title insurance for an encroachment like that will insure you against loss if it's, you are forced to remove it, mm -hmm. right? If somebody had come mm -hmm. to Gates and said, your deck is in my alleyway and we had given him coverage for forced removal, then you know whatever that costs essentially we would we would remedy him for that you know? so are there situations in in title insurance where where you guys look at it and say well title's not perfectly clean but you know what this is a risk we're willing to take you know this is that's kind of the nature of mm -hmm. insurance is is you know what's you know paying premiums to cover risks for what's at the fortuitous events right mm -hmm. um, so i guess yes because you're right most of the time um you know your neighbors don't want to make you move your your, your deck and they, they don't want to do that but at the same time you don't know who your neighbors are going to be when right you're, when you're moving yeah in. and a small fence uh, encroachment like that can be fixed with a, an agreement with the neighbor to allow it to be left in place but you know if it's a foot over you know sometimes a, an owner will say i'm comfortable with that right if somebody ever comes and makes you move it we'll figure it out but a lender is never going to be okay with that so a lender yeah. needs that coverage which that is the grease that makes the yeah. transaction go forward so that kind of goes back into something you said earlier about how title insurance is always required by lenders you know in residential or commercial transactions so what what is it that why is it that lenders have to have to be insured is, it, is that like a just just they all have this as an underwriting requirement or yes it really arose you know in the secondary market when they started selling their loans on the secondary market mm -hmm. you know it became part of the the package right so uh every purchaser of a loan on the secondary market wants to see that there's a title insurance uh, policy in place so uh with that you know since what we're doing is we're ensuring the priority of that lender's mortgage, yeah. right? They want to know, I've got a first lien on your property. Mm -hmm. You ever stop paying me, I've got the ability to take that property back in a foreclosure mm -hmm. and, and sell it to yeah. basically 
pay off your loan. It saves the buyers of those loans from having to go in and investigate the details of each individual loan. They would have to go look at that if, without title insurance. They'd have to go look at that loan, say, was it done right? Does the attorney that closed it have sufficient malpractice insurance to cover it if there's a problem? Mm -hmm. And now they can look and say, nope, highly rated title insurance company says it's good. That means it's good. Even if it's not good, they're insured that it's good. Yeah. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about tacking on the policies and kind of how that works. Um, but, you know, the, bringing up the point you just made about um, the lenders always requiring it and it, it affects the marketability of the loan um, and things of that nature. A lot of times I'll research title with some of the properties and there'll be a deed of trust uh, and, and you can't find a pre-existing policy. And is that just because you think it's a fly-by-night company that folded up or do you think it's, it's the lender just chose not to require one or how does... I think it's... Uh... It could be a combination of factors, right? Um, you know, you do have lenders who on certain transactions under a certain level may not require a title insurance policy, but you have a lot of issuing agents out there that come and go. They're not all located within the state of North Carolina necessarily, yeah. right? So finding that prior title policy can be difficult. Right, um, reporting them to their carrier, yeah. right? Their agents for whomever, and they may issue the policy, and that policy may in fact exist, but it may exist only in their office they never gave the policy to the carrier, and then their office closed, or, or, yeah. or they got and, out of North Carolina. And the way I understand investors is that you guys are kind of like um, State Farm or, or Nationwide, where you're an underwriter or an insurance company, but you're also an agency as well. Is, is my understanding correct, or is that on the commercial side? Yes. So we are we are an underwriter, right? Mm -hmm. Which is different. So the, ultimately, the the risk is on our we call our paper, right? We we accept that risk. We uh, are an agent. Uh, on the commercial side for certain commercial deals, we utilize that, but for the most part, we act as an underwriter. I see. So back, you know, when you're looking at title insurance companies, you look at all the ratings, you want to have one that's highly rated, we have all the highest ratings that you can have. Yeah. But we aren't the biggest national title insurance company, mm -hmm. so on larger deals, we do write as an agent for one of the bigger companies. Gotcha. And just what I was thinking, because from my experience, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll submit an opinion um, or commit a request, and I'm sending it to a local office. A lot of times um, when I'm working with investors, there's a local investor's office. So I just assumed that the, lo that the local office was an agency. But I guess that's... It's a direct issue. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Maybe and, that's and what we, I meant with the We do have one. some agents yeah. as yeah. well. They're exclusive agents. Mm -hmm. But so yes, so we do have some relationships where there are agencies, but they are solely investors' agencies. They are not um, independent. North Carolina has some peculiarities uh, with respect to, you know, one, pricing. You know, it's my understanding that with, with insurance products, it's, it's regulated by the, the Department of Insurance. So how does, it, how, how, does, how does that interaction go? Do you guys deal with, with, um, you know, with your pricing of premiums? Um, do you get edicts from the state as far as this is what you're gonna charge, or do you have to apply for what you want to charge? So the rates have to be filed with the Department of Insurance. There is a rating bureau in North Carolina, uh, which is made up of a number of uh, insurance underwriters, and they file their rates and they have to be approved by the Department of Insurance. We want to raise rates, you know, a penny. That's got to be approved by the Department of Insurance. So yes, for the most part, rates are, are fairly standard in North Carolina, which is a little different than other places. I mean, in Virginia, for instance, I mean, you could bid on title mm -hmm. insurance, right. right? You know, so it's a, it's a bid state, they call it. So. When, when I, I remember, I, I tried doing that early on and I would, I would sit, you know, when I first started, I'd be like, well, what, what can you do for me on this? Or, or what can, you know, because people would ask me to do it. Like, all right, well, that makes sense. I'll, I'll go get you the best rate. I'd be like, well, I don't know. I've asked four people and the first three have all come back the same, but I'll let you know when I, when I hear back from the four. But yeah, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a regulated, it's a regulated right. industry. I pay what you pay. That's yeah. right. I don't get an employee discount. That's right. <laughs> and so we compete on service mm -hmm. and accessibility and reasonability in terms of dealing with those issues. Yeah. You know, the people that you know you can trust to come up with solutions to problems, you know, that's who you want to work with. That's right. No, I, I, I agree 100%. You know, and it, it's, it, it can just be kind of tricky. And one of the other things, you know, with North Carolina being an attorney closed state, a lot of times, so we've, we're seeing an influx, I'm sure in Raleigh and Charlotte, the, the coastal North Carolina area is seeing an influx of, uh, of new residents, um, you know, as a result of work from home. I think, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons for it, but we're, but it, it, and so a lot of folks that are buying their new homes or, or, uh, or, or second or vacation or whatever it might be, don't get what's going on. They ask, but what about escrow? Or what about, they, they're used to, you know, like, well, we are the escrow. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, 
You know, it's like, I don't know, that's just, that's the way it has to be here. It's just, it's just odd. Um, yeah, so in, in title insurance in North Carolina, really all we do is issue the title insurance on the residential side, right? We do a little more mm -hmm. in the commercial side, but in the residential side, we just issue the title insurance, which is wholly different from a lot of states where the title company actually searches the title, closes the transaction, and issues the title insurance. Yep. In North Carolina, there's a statute that does not allow us to do that. Right, we have to issue our policy and not to bore you, but based on an opinion of an attorney who's not an employee or agent yeah, of the company. Right. That, that man, attorneys are always angling for you know to hold on to something. So that makes sense. <laughs> so how? Do, what's the distinction between the commercial end, where there's there's additional steps that you can do in the commercial end that, that are that aren't in residential? Yep. So the residential rules do require a lot of that, and and some of those rules continue to apply. We have to get an opinion of an outside attorney to do our work, but. Because we're dealing with people nationwide, they're buying commercial property here, they do expect the title company sometimes to be the neutral party, Switzerland in a prisoner exchange of properties, basically. Yeah. And so we will get some documents in, we'll do that, but we'll also order title searches. So you've got a client that's looking to buy a property in Charlotte, you may not be searching Charlotte because of the distance away, we'll go get that opinion for you and do that. You may then close the deal, but again, because the parties aren't used to sending buyer's counsel the money, yeah. they're nervous about that, they may send it to the title insurance company and we'll handle the escrow there and disperse that based on instructions from the attorneys in the transaction. Yeah, probably about two or three times a year, I'll get one of those like, look, I'll give you the money when it when it records or something like that. Right. Like, no, no, no. There's we got the good fun settlement act and right. like no, no, no. That you, you don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I don't trust the attorneys. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, you know who does? Who, who does? <laughs> you know that 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 makes sense. But those are always fun uh, interactions to get to go through that and say, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know jeopardize my license for this you know this this thousand dollars or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. But you know, I mean, people don't trust attorneys. So I think you hit the nail on the head there. And, you know, speaking of attorneys. So uh, attorneys, uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't think so, but tend to be the biggest marks on a lot of these like wire and phishing schemes. And so I know you guys um, help folks a lot with kind of best practices evolved to to stop that. Um, how first question I have for you is how do wire scams kind of relate to the title insurance in industry? Is this just is this just information you're providing to the escrow and attorney offices, or is, or is it? Is it a title insurance issue? It's really, I mean, it can be a title insurance issue, but at the end of the day, we're educating the attorneys, the realtors, hopefully the clients. You know, we're trying to get as much word out on the street about this problem because it can hit anybody, right? Um, and I don't know if we want to talk at all about it, describing yeah. how it happens, well, right? Well, so yeah, so a lot of the folks that, um, you know, that, that listen to the show are attorneys, and so that's, that's one of the things I like to have on smart people and insurance and um, you know realtors or bankers you know it is to kind of help people understand what to look for and and potential problems and you know I think you know lawyers tend to be egomaniacs sometimes so the the, the typical schemes I've seen is it's always like you know dear counsel you know I need assistance for you know for multi-million dollar purchase uh, you know it could be land could be whatever it might be and that makes sense like well of course they're gonna go to me you know, if it's, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, but, you know, just for mine, it's like, all right, so you don't know, I've never heard of this person, you know, they're, they're emailing me directly. They are, um, they call me counsel or sir or something like that. You know, so it's probably a, uh, you know, a canned email that's getting mm -hmm. sent everywhere around, but I get those maybe once a day, once yeah, every yeah, other day. Absolutely. And I guess it only, it's the rule of a hundred, you know, it only takes one. And then, uh, you know, you've made, you know, you've, Right. Got quite a bounty. But the scammers are very good. That, I mean, you kind of see it in two ways. Spoofing emails, mm -hmm. right? They, they find a way to make it look like it's coming from investor's title, but they leave out the E. And so, yeah, and you don't notice that. And so you think you've gotten some more interest. Or maybe, you know, somehow they figure out a way to change the attachment that you sent. Yeah. It's a legitimate email from you, but they somehow intercepted it. In, in technology things, they're so good at technology, they ought to be able to find an honest way to make money off of that yeah. knowledge. But So you get the wrong wiring, wiring instructions. And so what we always recommend is you need to call somebody before you wire money. On the commercial side, we have clients sending us earnest money deposits. Yeah. Individuals out there that we don't have the upper, we don't know who they are in advance, so we can't have educated them before. So we're trying to send them information. Call somebody you know on the deal. We'll reach out to them separately and say, hey, here's how you call us. And then we'll send the wiring instructions and call us to confirm that you've got the right thing. 
Well, one of the things I try to do is is say, look, we're never, ever, ever going to change our wiring instructions. You know, maybe one, now I say never, ever, ever. I mean, there could be one day, you know, t 10, 15 years down the road, and, um, you know, but it, it's just such a hassle, you know, right. with, with all the, the reconciliation to change your, you, you know, to, to open a new trust account. It's just, it's just, I really, really don't want to do it. And so, but I understand that's typically the way it goes is they intercept or they, they realize they've hacked your email. And by they, I'm talking about the, the scammers have hacked your email and they say, all right, the, the, um, there's a transaction coming up. I'm going to pretend to be the attorney and I'm going to send the prospective buyer an email saying, last minute, sorry, last minute hiccup. You know, I'm going to need you to send it to the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the Royal Bank of Nigeria or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, instead of whatever was, was intended. And, and it's like, all right, well, cool. Thanks for the, thanks for the update. But, uh, and that happened to some folks I know where they, they came to the, the um, to do their closing for a home and they just sold a home and had a substantial down payment they were making and they go there and, and then the closing attorney sits there with them and says, um, you know, she's walking through the settlement statement and says, so we just need you to wire, um, you know, this, this amount in before we'll be able to record. And they're like, oh, well, good news, I already did that two days ago. And, no, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. no. Well, and so to, to, to scare and help the attorneys that may be listening, is the story I have that was a close call from somebody was they had uh, a, a seller's counsel sent to buyer's counsel wiring instructions for the seller. Mm -hmm. Buyer counsel is going to hold it, you know, close everything, send it to the seller. Uh, buyer's counsel calls seller's counsel and says, got the wiring instructions, can you verify them for me? They verify it. Right? Well, as it turns out, the, wiring, the seller had emailed the wiring instructions to seller's counsel. Yeah. Seller's counsel hadn't done any independent verification. They just read them off the email. That email oh, no. had already been intercepted before oh, no. seller's counsel got it. So those were wrong. But buyer's counsel kind of somehow realized and thought to call the seller directly before closing. They discovered the problem because they called the primary source and they called the seller and they found it out beforehand. But it was that close. So you, yeah. it's always call the person who actually you you know, the, you're going to send yeah. the money to. But you know, and, and so sometimes I guess, and that's good. You, you gotta have their information independently. Like if they're a client, you know, you would have their information in their system. Because a lot of times it'll, you know, I'll see people that'll they'll get an email and then it, you know and they'll say here and they'll have the number. Please call to confirm an yeah, email. That's like, not oh, the yeah, number. No, 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 you don't do that. Right. Yeah, you don't do that. But <laughs> a number in the file that's already existing. That's the number to call. Yeah, and so and I've always heard that that kind of a best practice thing is that you want to. Um, you know, never use un or um, just regular email mm -hmm. to send your wiring instructions. That's right. Encrypted email important. And and so I guess the concern there is you don't want folks to um, you know to intercept your your email so they can manipulate your wiring instructions. Is that that, that yes? Yeah. So, I mean, see, the way these hackers work is you know I mean you just think how much we use email in residential real estate transactions or commercial real estate yeah. transactions, right? Uh, the attorney's emailing, the realtor's emailing, the client's emailing. Uh, if it's not encrypted, the hackers are looking for keywords. They're looking for closing, you know, wire, you know, words like that. And when they find that, then they dive deeper, yeah. and that's when they start the phishing, right? And you know, they may fish who knows how many people a day. If they get one, right? Yeah. They're somehow successful. that somehow that secure email, and you need to give uh, your next podcast can have the techies to explain this. <laughs> yeah. you know, sort of puts the, you know some type of protection on that, you know email and it goes through and nobody can read that because it's encrypted unfortunately sometimes that means you have to log into a system to read the email yeah but you also know what you got you can trust what you got. and you still need to call it's like the, the two-factor authentication that everybody hates i mean you know my only complaint about that is is when you're dealing with like a, a hundred different parties and they all have their own secure email system mm -hmm. and I mean luckily you know the, the computers tend to keep up with those passwords but then when we update the password all that I can't recall and I don't know right. it's just it but you know it's, it's the world we live in so it's, a, <laughs> it's an annoyance that, that you got to deal with. Yes. Yeah we sometimes I mean I know I know several residential attorneys even though it's not really my world is they require at closing they, first of all they try to require people come to the closings yeah. and then bring their wiring instructions like actually bring a piece of paper with it. Let's go back to the completely old fashioned way. I don't want to get it by email. You can yeah. you know, come go to your bank, get it from your bank and then walk it here. Well, speaking of that, that brings up an, an issue that I know is probably, you know, kind of a, you know, it's a may or may not be a hot button issue in your world, but like the, the e-recording. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess North Carolina, and I was just having a discussion with a, with a friend of mine um, had court this morning and I was talking about, in, in my opinion, North Carolina is just drastically behind 
the civilized world and, and especially even South Carolina um, as far as the court systems and how we operate you know for example North Carolina you have to in a state court uh, you have to file a lawsuit you have to walk you have to walk uh, down to the courthouse or you know you have to go inside and hand them the stack of paper and file it um, you don't you don't have that any most other there may be some states out there but you know, South Carolina doesn't do it that way and a lot of states don't do it that way but you know it's kind of with e-recording we do have that which is nice but we don't have the the uh, liens our, our systems archaic in, in my opinion, with respect to looking up liens, like you get, there's no real time. Right. Um, so kind of the, the bucket issue. Yeah. So that's what that's what I'm getting into. Is you know, in the, I guess in the old days, you would walk down to the register of deeds and you would you would check. You know, you would, you one you do your update, make sure that that nothing has changed, and then you go check the bucket to make sure there's no no liens or or, or out conveyances or whatever that have happened, and then you'd put yours in the queue to record. But so you know, here it's. You know we're recording and submitting online, but you're not going down to check the bucket, and um, you know the the powers that be haven't figured out how to make that information av immediately available. I know the, the the old basket or bucket. Yeah. You know we, we've we've talked to more clerks than we can shake a stick at. You know to why, why do we still have this? Right. Yeah. Why can't we get rid of the bus bucket or the basket? And you know in some counties it's you know an hour behind in some counties it's a day maybe two days behind right yeah um, and you know that is a scary thing and you know, there are transactions out there that are more risky than others when we talk about the bucket right a lot of times what you're worried about in the bucket is a, a lien filing right if you got a new construction uh, a mechanics lien being put in the bucket and not getting filed before the builder sells it to the buyer you know we have a relatively new system in North Carolina called liens and C which helps with that a good bit right um, uh, so you can kind of get an idea from what's been filed at liens and C it's not a lien per se but their notices to the lien agent you know typically there's four or five filings on that system but you know you start to see more than that yeah maybe this builders yeah you know they might, might get to check a little closer uh, when it comes to that and two things I have that on that one is the first thing is that it with the whole basket issue It brings us back to why title insurance. Yeah, because guess what? That's not malpractice. It's impossible to search Yeah, especially in a COVID world, you know masks and everything like that We can't you, you can't search that so you're telling us, you know what you've done yeah. We know you haven't searched that that's a risk We have decided that we take you know and if we have a builder that has all sorts of issues, we might say, you know what, we're not going to take the <laughs> yeah. risk on that issue because we're worried about that. Well, is that so? So, with respect to that, so is that you'd, you'd say, look, I've got this builder, and then you might say, well, hold on, those guys are always getting, you know, those guys are, all, you know, you, you need to check the bucket on that one because because these folks are, you know, they just they, they get sued a lot. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, they, they they like their payment disputes. Yes. But so it's kind of one of those things you need to look into on the front end. That's right. So, uh, you know, the process is we issue a commitment to issue our policy. It'll have requirements on it that need to be met mm -hmm. before we'll issue it. If it's somebody like that, there are special considerations that we, we, we'd let you know. And then we put a special requirement in there that you need to do X, Y, Z before you move forward. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, what do you, with respect to a lot of folks that, that listen are, are realtors, and, you know, sometimes realtors have title insurance preferences. I'd say 90 to 95% of the ones that, that I do, don't really, they just kind of stay out of that. Um, is there things besides um, advising their clients to get their surveys insured, which I think is tremendous advice, is there anything else that you would suggest to them as far as why they should have a preferred title insurance company or, or, or should they get involved in that, that end of it? Well, as Gates mentioned earlier, you know, we're not competing on price, we're yeah. competing on service. Right. So uh, we also have to remember that it, uh, on the back end, the product is the policy itself. Right. We, investors title, for example, is a North Carolina based underwriter. Our claims department is in Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. Right. So if there's a problem with your title, we have somebody on the ground that can and they can go to Halifax County. Right. They can go out west to Watauga County. They can go to Boone, you know, as opposed to the larger companies who may have a claims department in California or Florida. Uh, I didn't realize that. I thought that investors was nationwide. And we, well, we are nationwide, mm -hmm. but yeah, you know, we are based here. Mm -hmm. We do things nationwide. Definitely a southeastern focus. Frankly, an eastern half of the U.S. focus. You got to give me a couple states on the other side of the Mississippi. Yeah, you know, we get to Texas and things like that, but we aren't doing California. But to the point of a mainly North Carolina or Carolina Southeast podcast, 
we've got title attorneys that know that area. We do it ourselves. One thing we're talking about agents before, those agents don't, ha if, yeah. an agent doesn't handle the claim at all. They flip it to the national company. We're, the, we're that company. And so we're calling a, a group that Ryan knows very well that deals with those claims, knows North Carolina law. They aren't just saying, hey, here's a, a easement across the thing. We'll just throw them money. No, let's look at the actual rights and let's solve that. But guess what? We also have to retain money under the insurance laws to handle claims, and so we've got money to pay claims. That's why that's why we're highly rated, by the way, is because we have yeah, good retention. I want to get into that. So what, what are the difference? So are you talking about AM Best? Is that who rates you, or is that... Uh, that's one always that comes to mind. I always hear about, we're AM Best rated. I think, uh, yes, and then there's another company, uh, Demotech. I Demotech and Kroll, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, but maybe. we have the highest ratings on all of those, yeah. and because it's something that, especially in the commercial world, as we expand and go to yeah. more states, you know, we might be in a state where somebody doesn't know of investors and I provide that information to them and all of a sudden they're like, yep, you're a title company that we can use. So these these ratings, is it kind of like your typical classroom, like A through F or what do you want to look out for? Like, cause you know, I, I guess in the world of going out to eat, you know, where we're in, you know, an 80 might be good on a, on a math test, <laughs> you know, that's not what you want at your, at your seafood restaurant. But like, so is that how it works? Cause you know, if I say, oh, well, this company is an 80, does that mean, no, 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 don't, don't mess with that. Or is it A, B, C, D or how do the, I think it varies by company, right? I think you, you do have some that have the, the ABCD, you have some that use like superior and best. And, right. Okay. right? And obviously what you're looking for, if you can get it mm -hmm. at the same cost, right? right? Like we talked about, yep. you get the one that's the highest rated, right? right? There's no reason not to. But if one of them does it like bond ratings, you know, that where they're all A, right? Yep. But it's A prime, A double prime, A triple prime, because nobody wants to not be an A. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one of them's like that. But we have, like, literally in all of those, we have the highest possible standing. Understood. Well, guys, I really appreciate you guys coming down. I've learned a lot, and I hope the folks that are, that are listening uh, have taken away about the importance of title insurance and what it can and can't do. So I thank you guys for making the trip and it was, it was a pleasure meeting you. Great to do it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. it.